All right. Welcome to Ocular Pathology Rounds on Wednesday, October, November 29th. We're no longer in October. Uh, all right. All right. The first, first case I will be presenting is a 13-year-old uh, Australian shepherd. The history we got was pretty brief, but they said suspect intraocular mass of the left eye, which is this one. Uh, and then also recent blepharitis, which we will not cover today because they also sent eyelids. So um, here is the globe. We decided the globe. Is it okay now? Did I miss something? Okay. All right. Um, all right. Sorry. So the globe was bophthalmic when we received it. The And the, when we hemisected it, the cornea is always placed at the top in these gross images and the optic nerve at the bottom. Um, so the globe was bouphthalmic. Uh, the cornea was very cloudy. There was a mottled tan to brown mass in the iris and ciliary body. And then the retina is detached <clears throat> and quite thick actually. And then um, there was some dark brown subretinal fluid. Um, and that's about it. There's also a cataract present. And so, those are the main uh, gross findings. So now we'll go ahead and switch to <laughs> microscope stuff. All right. Okay. Um, so there is the cornea, and then here's the iris and the ciliary body. Here's the lens, and then this is the retina with the optic nerve kind of back there. Um, so at this <clears throat> lower magnification, and this is actually quite a thick section, which was kind of an accident, but um, we can still see the morphology of the cells. But uh, the iris in particular is thickened and very kind of dark purple pink. And that usually means that there's some sort of cellular infiltrate, which we'll get to. And then the retina is detached and it's a little bit uh, thick and maybe a little bit hypercellular itself, um, which can be sort of not normal, but um, can be present in a detached retina. But anyway, we'll, we'll go ahead and jump into the uh, higher mag. So, uh, once again, the iris is quite thickened and it has a, a cellular infiltrate that is forming some epithelial structures. So even at low mag, um, you can see that there are some cords and trabeculae of the uh, neoplastic cells. This is a neoplasm. Um, <clears throat> so you can see those sort of anastomosing cords and trabeculae and through here, there's a little bit of necrosis in this field. Uh, most of the cells are not pigmented, but there are some cells with melanin sort of admixed with the neoplastic epithelial cells, um, which could either be pre-existing melanocytes or the neoplastic cells themselves uh, producing melanin. When we go higher mag, the cells are eh, kind of polygonal to occasionally cuboidal. Um, with variably distinct cell borders and some eosinophilic vacillated cytoplasm and round nuclei with uh, sort of finely stippled chromatin and one to two prominent nucleoli. Um, they exhibit mild to moderate variation in cellular and nuclear size and apparently not in this field that I landed on, but there are quite a few mitotic figures. Um, here's one right here. Um, so this pattern that we've seen so far is typical of an epithelial tumor. Um, the mitotic rate is pretty good for something slightly more malignant, um, but there are still two possibilities. So this could either be an iridociliary tumor originating within the eye, a primary intraocular tumor, or it could be a metastatic tumor. Um, if all we had was infiltration of the iris leaflet, then um, I would consider this to be most likely a primary intraocular tumor, so an iridociliary origin tumor. Um, when we look on this other side over here, um, it does infiltrate into the sclera. 
So right in this area and this area, this one might actually be tracking along the um, angular aqueous plexus. Um, but I was convinced here of scleral invasion, which is an indication of malignancy, uh, particularly, I mean, especially if we're uh, diagnosing this as an iridociliary tumor. So this would be an iridociliary carcinoma. However, there are some other interesting features of the tumor in this globe. And uh, Leandro likes to say uh, that the neoplastic cells were um, exhibiting neoplastic tourism, maybe? Is that what you call it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so these cells are uh, extending out into the eye. They're carpeting <laughs> the anterior vitreous here, where they're forming more single layers of cells. Um, and out here, um, they're sort of mingling with a little bit of a loose fibrovascular stroma. When we move to the back of the eye, the cells are carpeting and infiltrating the chorid and possibly the tapetum um, right in this area. A little higher. So cells with similar features to those we saw up front in the main masses are there in the chorid and tapetum. And then they're also carpeting the inner retinal surface. So this is this sort of ocular neoplastic tourism is a little bit unusual for any iridociliary tumor uh, of iridociliary origin, but it sometimes happens. We tend to call those sort of an atypical cystic, cystic variant. And as far as we know, it does not alter the prognosis. Um, so I did a PAS stain, which I'll show you in a little bit. But before we go and look at that, I will share the rest of the features of this eye with you. Um, so there is um, cortical lens fiber liquefaction here. So there's a cortical cataract. There is corneal disease, including or uh, superficial stromal vascularization and maybe some in inflammatory cell infiltrates. There is hemorrhage in this eye and all the ocular chambers, little bits here and there. There's some of it right there in the anterior chamber and some high protein exudate. And then as we said, the retina is diffusely detached and it's very atrophied. Um, so we've really lost most of the nuclear layers, layering of the retina. These are probably some outer nuclear layer nuclei, so the photoreceptor nuclei forming little rosetti kind of structures. And then the optic nerve head back here is quite atrophied. Um, and then actually this is neoplastic cell infiltration around the borders of the optic nerve. So um, I did a PAS stain because iridociliary tumors classically will produce, or not classically, but often, maybe 60% of the time, will produce nice thick PAS positive basement membranes. Um, and the thickness is what differentiates them from those produced by other cells, cell types, cell origins, I should say. Um, so this one had some areas with some thicker PAS positive basement membranes. In the iridociliary tumors, they tend to form around small groups of neoplastic cells. So these guys right in here, they kind of get a little bit chubby. So like this kind of thing here. Um, however, I have definitely seen better ones. So I don't really feel like the PAS stain answered the question of like whether this was actually neoplastic, uh, sorry, uh, iridociliary tumor or not. In this area, most of the PAS positive material that we're seeing is actually around blood vessels. So that's just part of the fibrovascular stroma and not actually associated with the neoplastic cells themselves. Um, so uh, let me write in here, it's looking a little better. These are slightly better. Um, but anyway, there was still some doubt in my mind. So when I uh, wrote up the report and diagnosed the, um, gave a diagnosis to this, I called it an intraocular malignant epithelial neoplasm with carpeting behavior and thick basement membranes. Uh, the margins were clean, which is good news. Um, so my two differentials were an atypical cystic variant of an iridociliary carcinoma uh, versus a metastatic carcinoma. 
Um, I did recommend pancytokeratin and neuron-specific enolase to try to differentiate those two, but I did caution that immunohistochemistry would not necessarily give us the end final answer, and that ultimately I decided, or I suggested that they should stage the patient to try to look for primary tumors elsewhere. So we have not received any other follow-up on this case. So um, iridociliary epithelium of that is non-neoplastic is of neuroepithelial origin. And oddly enough, that means it expresses vimentin and does not express cytokeratin. Um, so with these tumors, um, iridociliary adenomas are pretty much diffusely, will diffusely express vimentin strongly, um, and sometimes they will start expressing uh, cytokeratin. Um, when they become more malignant, i.e. extend into the sclera, um, they tend to express cytokeratin a little bit more strongly, but they usually do continue expressing vimentin. And the neuron-specific enolase is sort of a substitute for vimentin. It's a little bit more specific for intraocular stuff. Um, so if, and these tumors, uh, neuro, sorry, non-neoplastic iridocellular epithelium will express NSE or non neuron-specific enolase. Um, so taken together, when you look at the expression pattern of cytokeratin and NSE, um, usually we can get a, a pretty good feel of whether it's primary or not. My cautionary tale is that a metastatic carcinoma can do whatever the heck it wants. So when they end up in the eye, we cannot always have, um, like a final answer with with immunohistochemistry, which is why I suggested staging the patient. So Karen Aranjo here in the chat <clears throat> is asking, um, did you consider a geomorphic adenocarcinoma or was not disruptive enough or infiltrative enough? Uh, good question. So the question was, did I consider naming this a pleomorphic iridociliary carcinoma? Um, I didn't. Um, however, I think it could be a possibility in this case. Um, the pleomorphic iridociliary carcinoma is the quote-unquote only and truly malignant form of an iridociliary tumor, i.e. has been shown to metastasize, unlike every other kind of iridociliary tumor. Um, I think personally that the division between... I don't think we have good features to truly say, oh, that's the pleomorphic variety, um, because in my opinion, when we have more convincingly uh, uh, tumors that would be lumped into the pleomorphic category. Honestly, I don't think the cellular pleomorphism is necessarily all that prominent uh, personally. Um, so I think that, that it's a very gray area. Um, I tend to use that diagnosis when the entire globe is filled and effaced by a tumor, which essentially in my mind means that it's just been going on longer than a tumor than, than the other types of tum iridociliary tumors. So. I think it's a very gray area. Um, and up to this point, we don't have good uh, features to look for to suggest that this is one that we should recommend the possibility of metastatic lesion coming from the tumor. And of course, in a case like this, where we are maybe a little bit worried about this primary intraocular neoplasm, this possible primary intraocular neoplasm metastasizing away from the eye, when they stage the patient, if they find lesions elsewhere, it's unclear whether those are a primary tumor that started elsewhere in the body and ended up in the eye or vice versa, that it was a primary intraocular tumor that metastasized away from the eye. So it's a little bit complicated. So, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. All righty, moving on to a totally different species. This is a green sea turtle, um, six years old. Um, so this creature had multiple areas of external fibropapilloma tumors. They did a CT scan that was negative for internal tumors, um, but it had uh, ocular surface and periocular tumors uh, of both eyes. Um, however, they only removed one. And I, I'm not sure, I think this creature might still be alive. They didn't specify whether it had been euthanized. Um, but uh, they got in touch with us and asked if we wanted the eye and we said, yes, please. Um, so here is the eye. So this is the, the left eye. Um, and so what we have are these multi sort of lobular, um, smooth, sort of grayish to almost translucent looking um, excrescences or masses um, that are kind of clustered around the limbus and extending onto the corneal surface of this eye. Um, 
here is what it looked like once hemisected. Um, so it's a little, it's hemisected off center. So we aren't getting through the pupil because there's a lens right up there. And so this is um, more sort of the uh, limbal surface right here. So we got an extra slice of sort of the cap, which is somewhere in this area. And then I did deeper section, multiple deeper sections of the globe to look at uh, these uh, excrescences. So um, I will start with the sort of extra slice. So here it is. So the turtle has a scleral ossicle here, which then, um, and then also a scleral cartilage, which is this lighter purple there. And so this is the ocular surface, but I think it's actually quite peripheral. So this is close to the limbus. And then, and then here is that uh, exophytic mass that we have. So this is a disease that is well known to um, the uh, sort of zoo, wildlife, exotic pathology world and clinical world. Um, so this is a fibropapilloma of a sea turtle, which is primarily, as far as I know, associated with herpes virus infection. It is an alpha, al sorry, alpha herpes virus. Um, and I think it's alpha herpes virus five, colonid or chelonid uh, alpha herpes virus five. Um, so what it induces is um, this really robust epithelial proliferation of surface epithelium. And then kind of like the equine sarcoid, it also induces um, a stromal uh, proliferation of cells. However, don't get confused because the sarcoid is a fact associated with the papilloma virus. <laughs> and this is a herpes virus. <laughs> um, but anyway, so it induces this really robust... Um, I'm not sure if they really consider this neoplastic uh, stromal proliferation or if it's just a reactive stromal proliferation. Um, you can see in this area, uh, we've got a mitotic figure right here. Um, but yeah, definitely uh, spindle cell proliferation there, which is probably fibroblastic. And then the epithelium, um, it's kind of like a papilloma in that it is in technically a neoplastic proliferation, but not necessarily a dangerous one to the local tissue or to the animal's health overall. Meaning that this is not a neoplasm that will metastasize to internal organs. However, it is known that the herpes virus can form tumors in internal organs. I don't think it's an exact metastasis of surface epithelium. Um, and it will also induce this fibroblastic response in internal tumors as well, which is why they said this, this creature was negative for internal tumors makes me think that actually this animal is not had not actually been euthanized. Uh, anyway, so to look a little bit more at the, the sort of neoplastic epithelial proliferation, um, it is squamous epithelium on this uh, ocular surface here and at the limbus, and the cells pretty much are exhibit very orderly maturation. So we've got a nice basilar epithelium, epithelial layer here, and then it transitions up into the more surface area uh, types of uh, cells. Um, so another interesting feature that has been reported is that these tumors often have spirochid trematode eggs in them. Yep. So this one happened to have that, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, spirochids are uh, pretty much universally affect sea turtles across the world. Um, and in stranded sea turtles, they tend to have a higher parasite burden, which is probably an indication of... Um, well, the cause effect there might not have been worked out. It might just be a, the effect of being immunosuppressed. Um, so I will go ahead and show you a little bit more of the actual globe, which the internal aspects of this globe were pretty normal. But um, so here is a slightly more central section. We're still not in the pupil, but here's the lens, here's the iris. So this is the probably peripheral cornea still in this section. And you can see how proliferative that uh, sort of tumor is. So proliferative epithelium with a nice reedy ridge formation, and then this really robust uh, fibroblastic uh, stromal proliferation in this in the underlying stroma. I was struck by how many pigmented cells were in this stroma, and I think that just has more to do with the induction of sort of proliferation of whatever cell is present 
in this case, I'm assuming these are just stromal melanocytes that are proliferating. I don't know exactly what they, I guess another option would be some sort of macrophage that have picked up melanin, um, but they are quite spindle to stellate shaped, which is more characteristic of um, a melanocyte rather than a melanin laden macrophage. Um, other features of the sea turtle eye, which I think is something interesting and I still don't have a good answer, is this sort of irregular proliferation of the scleral cartil uh, cartilage. And um, we've seen this before in other sea turtle eyes, and we I still don't know whether this is a normal aging feature versus some abnormality or, uh, and maybe it's associated with ocular or intraocular abnormalities. I don't really know the answer to that, but it can be like really, really pronounced. Do we know the age of this turtle? Or... They, uh, they said six years. Okay. So this one is yeah. not the oldest right. that we've yeah. seen. Um, Anyway, so I would love to get to the bottom of the uh, sea turtle scleral cartilage changes. Um, the, the interesting thing about that reaction in the posterior sclera is that a lot of the age-related changes we see in the sclera of multiple animals, right? Like mineralization in horses, that osseous metaplasia, cartilaginous metaplasia, like in small ruminants, is that that same type of location? Posterior yeah. sclera peri back in every dish. Yeah. So there might be something about that. Yeah. Uh, maybe in a next future rounds, I will bring this other one that was just like absolutely crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe I'll try to remember to do that one next time. Um, anyway, so uh, yeah. So there we go. This is a nice example of fiber papilloma in a sea turtle. Um, unfortunately, it is uh, universally present across the globe. And I think it's actually on the rise, unfortunately, the, the prevalence. So probably related to all the environmental problems that are present out there uh, affecting the oceans and et cetera, et cetera. So um, there we go. Any other questions? I thought saw there was more in the chat there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Is there anything important in the chat? Let's see, there's no, I have Got it. Lots of phrases for the turtle, please. Okay. <laughs> All right. I feel like maybe. Yes. Uh, so next we have, it should be 6484 underneath there. Um, <clears throat> this is a 13 year, nine month old spade female Pomeranian. Um, clinically, they describe bouthalmia, uh, an elevated intraocular pressure, hyphema, episcleral congestion, and the other eye is totally normal. Um, and they also describe under general medical condition that this patient has congestive heart failure. Um, so little dog with a bloody eye and some glaucoma. Um, so uh, starting from the front, we have a slightly cloudy cornea. Um, the intraocular chambers are filled with hemorrhage. Um, and in some areas, you can actually see hints of yellow and maybe some orangish, orangish hints. Um, and that implies that there this may be a somewhat more chronic hemorrhage uh, with maybe some hemocytorin and hematoidin. Um, the retina is right here or so. You can see that kind of coming up uh, with a retinal detachment. Um, and then uh, maybe not necessarily obvious per se, but uh, a lot of this hemorrhage, particularly in the vitreal chamber, uh, was somewhat solid, um, almost forming something of a mass effect, maybe also in the subretinal space as well. Um, there's also probably a bit of a cataract going on here, a um, bit of a cloudy lens, grossly. Uh, so that's the, the gross. Let's do histology. Mm -hmm. Right, let's just orient. Here's the cornea up here, um, but we're going to go back mostly to the posterior segment. Um, we're seeing the hemorrhage coming in already, though. But back here, it's most impressive. Uh, on histology as well, you can see those lovely hints of yellow hematoidin um, and likely some sort of coppery brown hemocytorin. Um, there's uh, lots of hemorrhage and fibrin admixed uh, in that area where there was maybe more of a mass effect grossly. 
Uh, you can trace the retina here, it is detached, and there are areas particularly near that sort of solid hemorrhage um, where the retina kind of peters out and disappears, um, which is most likely necrosis, and we'll confirm that going closer. Um, and you can see that on the other side, the retina as well. So let's drop in here though. Focus. Um, so here we have the retina that is still intact. There's a bit of an outer atrophy, which is mostly like, likely associated with ischemia of detachments. Um, but otherwise, the retina is recognizably retina. And then as you go towards that area where it sort of disappears, it basically does exactly that. Um, so we lose all cellular detail and uh, lots of sort of spindle cells. Um, and basically neovascularization, um, lots of little tiny blood vessels spread out into this area of solid uh, fibrin and hemorrhage. And then again, the lovely uh, blood breakdown products, hemocytor and hematoidin, uh, both extracellular and in macrophages. Um, so we know this is a very chronic hemorrhage. Um, so this finding uh, in the vitreal space and subretinal space in this case, um, is what we refer to in Coplau as fibrinoproliferative lesion, um, which basically just means uh, that there's a fibrin component. It's sort of solid and, and um, kind of being organized by these blood vessels, especially uh, blood vessels and spindle cells that come from a necrotic retina, um, very common. Um, and when we see fibrinoproliferative lesion, uh, the uh, most important thing to think about is systemic hypertension, uh, or the manifestations of the systemic hypertension in the eye. Um, and Probably one of the first areas that I'll look uh, after that in a dog is uh, in the central choroid and the peripapillary connective tissue, um, checking out those blood vessels to see what might be going on. Um, and let's see if we can find a particularly good example here. Mm -hmm. So I'd argue that, for example, in this one, there's a little bit of sort of extra uh, pink stuff, uh, subintimately um, right up underneath the endothelium, um, maybe a little bit of a thickened tunica media. I know that there are better examples in this eye, but as soon as you get in the hot seats, you know, I like some of these smaller vessels out here in the peripapillary tissue. So for example, these uh, little teeny tiny um, arterioles, uh, this one barely has a lumen visible um, with increased numbers of smooth muscle cells, somewhat disorganized in the tunica media. Um, so uh, there are, these are features that are consistent with hypertensive vasculopathy. I know that there are some that maybe have a little bit more of sort of the serum insidation in the walls. But of course, now that I'm here in the hot seat, I'm not gonna find a good one quickly. Um, but things like that, uh, lesions of vascular remodeling, uh, subintimal fibrosis, uh, if you put an elastin stain on this, sometimes reduplication of the elastic lamina, um, which we don't not going to see on his H&E uh, here, um, smooth muscle hyperplasia in the tunica media, um, and uh, sometimes serum insudation in the wall of the vessel, so it'll be like this pinkish um, sort of proteinaceous fluid in the wall of the vessel. Um, these are all changes that are potentially consistent with hypertensive vasculopathy. Um, so the ocular manifestations of systemic hypertension. Um, and this is probably a more classic presentation of systemic hypertension in the dog eye. Um, typically the fibrinoproliferative proliferative lesion and the vascular changes in the central choroid, retina, and or peripapillary connective tissue. Those are places you want to look. Um, in cats, it should be noted that uh, ureteral hemorrhages can be somewhat common for a manifestation of systemic hypertension. Um, so for cats, it's good to look at the... Um, iris, and uh, sometimes the vessels in the iris will also be the most significant with remodeling uh, in cat cases. Um, so good places to look for the cat. Um, so maybe not the most like exciting or exotic of a case, but I thought a good instructive one. Uh, and here is our basic diagnoses. Um, yeah. Like here. Um, and that's about it. Any questions? Okay, the next case. Um, in this case, we have a front view looking uh, at the cornea, if not through it. Um, and uh, the history on this one, we have a 13-year-old neutered male pug. Um, they described uh, that the primary vet placed a conjunctival graft and there was dehiscence of the graft. 
Um, they also know that there was an amyloid constrictor in this patient for poor systemic shunt, uh, but probably uh, not related directly to the ocular disease in this case, um, probably. Um, and there is some mild eyelid abnormalities uh, and corneal pigmentation in the other eye. Um, so that's the history for this case. Um, and looking at the gross photo, it's a really lovely gross photo. Um, we do have the sites of uh, corneal perforation or previous corneal perforation in the middle here where the cornea gets very thin. Um, and the cornea all around it is quite opaque um, and sort of white to white tan. Um, and then we can actually see the sutures where the graft would have been sort of sutured in place over this site of perf, this, uh, these slight bluish uh, foci here. Um, and then this is the pedicle graft itself. Um, and the pedicle is looking rather chubby uh, and um, sort of thickened, and it's not uh, attached anymore, deist, uh, as we <laughs> were told. Um, so uh, that's the gross on this case. Um, and we'll take a look at the histology. Uh, not that, this, there we go. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to show you a deeper section first that doesn't necessarily capture the optic nerve, but it will show the stuff in the cornea better, which is the main event in this case. See, we can do a subgross if it's not too ugly. Um, so here in the subgross with the cornea on our right, we do have the uh, pedicle coming into uh, the field there, and uh, we have an area of uh, marked thinning of the cornea, definitely not in focus, marked thinning of the cornea axially. Um, so let's take a look at that closer. Subgross is always a little bit ugly. Let's see, I'm going to flip it around so that it's the same direction that we were just looking at it in. There we go. There's a gonio slice. All right, so here's back to the cornea again. Let's start over here with the graft. Um, so this is that flap of conjunctiva that they had moved uh, to be on top of the cornea. Um, and I'm gonna come in a little bit closer onto this sort of thickened uh, or chubby looking part. Uh, so the conjunctival substantia propria is typically not this thick and dense in terms of the collagen. Um, if you go back over here, for example, this is somewhat more normal looking conjunctiva with this sort of looser uh, collagen stroma. Um, so the pedicle itself has become somewhat fibrotic in this case. Um, there's maybe even a little bit of granulation tissue formation right up underneath the epithelium. Um, it's somewhat congested and uh, probably better viewed in other sections. It was a little bit inflamed as well with a lymphoplasmacytic infl yeah, inflammation. Um, notably, we do also have epithelium on both sides of this pedicle. So this is theoretically the deep side that would have contacted the cornea, um, and it's covered by epithelium. Uh, and then we also have uh, epithelium, which sometimes is lost, but uh, we also have epithelium on this other side. Um, so that is significant, and we'll touch on that again later as we come over here to the site of the defect itself. So we're following the cornea uh, from the periphery into the site of the defect, uh, and you can see that the epithelium runs at an acute angle relative to the direction of the corneal stromal fibers as we start to get close to that defect. So that shows you that there was anterior stromal loss, um, which makes sense because we eventually got to a perforation. And it gets thinner and thinner as we go, and then eventually you see this end of decimase membrane that's ruptured. Um, and then basically the center area is not really normal corneal stroma anymore. It's basically filled in with fibrous tissue, um, but also the surface of it is completely re-epithelialized. We can follow, follow the epithelium all the way along. Um, yes, <laughs> this is an interesting little place as we go, because now we have a uh, piece of otherwise bare decimase membrane that's basically embedded on the surface of that defect, uh, and the epithelium is starting to grow over it. Uh, it's telling, it's sliding along, uh, doing what it's supposed to do to heal a defect in the epithelium. Um, there are sort of stem cell-like uh, cells near the periphery, and they pr uh, proliferate, and the epithelium is supposed to slide over the defects um, and heal the hole. So um, it slid over the entire surface of the fibrous tissue that plugged the defect, and also this little piece of decimase that came out. Um, which is super cute. The anchor to the graft. That's right. <laughs> uh, and then here's the other end of decimase on the other side of that defect. So um, we have uh, basically a healed or healing corneal perforation. Um, and then let's see if we can see. 
So uh, right here, uh, I call this adequate to decide on a collagenolysis that is ongoing in this case. So we have a corneal epithelium here. Uh, we have a corneal stroma that's looking a little bit sort of vacuolated with neutrophils in it. Uh, and then this cluster of epithelial cells has sunk into the superficial stroma here. Um, it's kind of awkward because sometimes you'll catch um, reedy pegs of hyperplastic corneal epithelium and tangential section, but uh, I thought that this was enough to call a collagenolysis. Um, that sinking of the epithelium is the key histologic feature to call it. Um, so potentially an ongoing collagenolysis or keratomalacia or AKA corneal melting in this case, which probably didn't help uh, in terms of trying to get that graft to take and the cornea to heal. Um, certainly still a neutrophilic keratitis as well. Um, and you can also see the, the blood vessels growing in from the periphery in this cornea here. Um, over on this side as well, before we move away, uh, we have the iris leaflet coming in, um, and the tip of it is fused into this fibrous tissue that then blends into the fibrous tissue at the uh, perforation site. So just a little bit of a focal anterior sneakia at that site. Um, I'm going to switch really quick to another slide. I think it's this one. Here it is. So in this level of the cornea, we have caught the sutures. And they're very pretty. Um, so here we have a suture, and here we have a suture. And you can see that they're multi-filament because there are sort of these multiple uh, cross sections of little poorly staining fibers. And let's see if we can make this happen because it's oh so pretty. Ah, there it is already. OK, we'll just leave it like that. <laughs> Polarizing them is very pretty. They look gorgeous. Thanks for coming, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so that's just a cool thing. Um, the significant thing to healing, though, uh, that I wanted to point out, uh, apart from showing the pretty, uh, is that we do have corneal epithelium that has grown down around the sutures uh, here. So it's completely surrounding this suture that's in the corneal stroma, for example. Um, and that may potentially have impeded healing as well. Um, so uh, just a couple of uh, features, basically a cornea with ongoing inflammation, um, probably the, the repithelialization didn't help healing. Um, it seems to have kind of extended underneath the pedicle um, and sort of between the pedicle and the corneal stroma. Um, and uh, I think I mentioned the ongoing collagenolysis. Uh, I said inflammation earlier, um, which was probably also part of the complications in this case. Um, so a complicated attempt to try and fix the cornea uh, for this uh, poor little pug. Um, and uh, things happened. Um, I don't think there's anything much else to show you in this eye. Um, so, so question for, for the, the uh, residents or any, anyone in there, any clinician. The, 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 those sutures were probably for the graph, like the original graph. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that what they were? Because they, they had, I think we discussed that during readouts, right? They had kind of interesting sort of semi-circular sort of... Uh, uh, distribution on the original one, and we wonder if there was the other kind of they go around. Um, so I we wonder. If other ones fell out. Because oh, yeah. okay. it does seem like there aren't any here. Yeah. yeah. All right. That makes sense. Just for yeah, we wonder if there was another attempt of something on top of the disease graph, or know. if that would be consistent with. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Sometimes we can see them back, and they're just gone. Yeah. <laughs> cool. I mean, you do wonder if there was still an active uh, like melting process going on, for example, in this mm -hmm. soupy looking cornea here, like they may have just pulled right out, they were, like, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> yeah, definitely a really cool observation. Um, so that's kind of all I have to show you. A kind of long list of diagnoses, um, but basically a, a dehist uh, conjunctival pedicle graft. Um, we have a question. Yeah, is there an increased chance of those like islands of epithelium around the suture if you go in at a place where it's like a melting cornea on your suture? Or is that just an increased chance? Yeah. Uh, the question was if there's an increased chance of the epithelialization extending around the corneal uh, sutures um, if uh, there is the corneal melting, and the answer is no, not necessarily. Um, which I always, I don't really know often what gets picked up by this micro, uh, microphone. So apologies if I repeated that. Uh, all right. <laughs> yeah, it's not taking photographs. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. Which yeah. leads us to hide. Yeah. Jamie. I need those. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
No photos. Yeah. Yeah. No photos. <laughs> Uh, all right. Now this was just to indicate that we we don't have a gross photo um, or a good representation photo for 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 this case. Um, uh, this is from a ten year old uh, male neutered domestic short hair cat um, with the findings of a proliferative conjunctival mass at the lateral canthus of the left eye. Um, otherwise, both eyes have nuclear sclerosis, and that was the extent of the history that uh, we received. Um, grossly, uh, the globe itself uh, was relatively unremarkable. We did note that there was some posterior luxation of the lens. Um, but um, in the uh, sort of dorsolateral conjunctiva, there was a proliferative papillomatous mass um, uh, there. Um, we also received some eyelids um, and the third eyelid, uh, as well, sort of separate from the globe, and um, some uh, two samples of periocular tissues that we uh, didn't have any um, anatomic orientation for. Okay, excellent. All right. Okay, there we go. All right. Um, okay, so we have cornea um, at the top here, optic nerve back here, uh, lens posterior luxated flopping around the globe. Um, and this is our uh, conjunctival mass uh, coming off uh, the, like I said, that dorsal lateral uh, conjunctiva. Uh, there wasn't much going on inside the globe, but we can take a minute. to just sort of appreciate nice cornea, nice open angle, pretty. Lens looks good. Uh, other than some a little bit of sectioning artifact, um, optic nerve, retina, all look very pretty. All right, so back to the elephant in the room. Um, so we have this unencapsulated mass that expands and effaces uh, the conjunctiva. Um, it uh, forms these lobules um, of sort of trabeculae and anastomorphs and cords um, of these neoplastic epithelial cells. Um, so they kind of have indistinct cell borders, uh, small amounts of this eosinophilic cytoplasm around over nuclei, uh, with some finely simple chromatin and usually a single prominent nucleus. Um, come across some mitotic figures. Um, here, um, it was fairly mitotically active. Um, Here's a few more, here, here, here. Um, these lighter pink areas um, are areas of necrosis um, in the center of the lobules. So this eosinophilic debris um, with this nuclear debris with some uh, neutrophils um, associated with the necrosis um, in the mass, a little bit of hemorrhage. And as we go along in some areas, um, they do sort of form little kind of frondy projections um, on the surface. They kind of come off. Again, it's a little fragmented, but um, you can maybe get that sort of uh, view, which is a, I think a common feature um, in this tumor. Um, the sections of the third eyelid also, unfortunately, had evidence of this tumor as well. Uh, 
Um, so here we have a section of third eyelid um, with a cartilage here in the center. Um, and again, we sort of have this neoplastic population of epithelial cells um, forming asini um, in this area. Um, and infiltrating into the gland itself. So here are some of the neoplastic cells. That, there's some uh, lymphoid nodules kind of associated with them. And then here's some of the um, gland of the third eyelid uh, with a little bit of inflammation here as well. Um, so, It's a little bit better. So this was, I think, pretty classic for what this looks like um, in the third eyelid. Um, so this is uh, a feline conjunctival surface adenocarcinoma. Um, here, um, and unfortunately, in the little bits of orbital tissue um, that were separately submitted, uh, there was also some evidence that it was uh, in the orbit as well. Let's see, here's the skeleton. So, so here's some of it invading into the orbital skeletal muscle. Um, um, so, um, like I said, the feline conjunctival surface adenocarcinoma had some orbital extension, um, so dirty margins uh, with uh, pretty much a normal globe. Um, these tumors are sort of poorly differentiated and they originate from the conjunctival epithelium. And they usually carry um, a poor prognosis with a potential for regional and distant metastasis. Um, of course, with dirty margins, um, the likelihood of local recurrence um, is uh, probable possible um, in this case as well. Uh, a theory that has not necessarily been proven is that they actually begin in the ducts of the gland of the epithelium of the, sorry, third eyelid. Or, yeah, gland of the third eyelid. Um, so sometimes uh, you might be able to appreciate them sort of originating in the ducts and extending out on the surface of the conch. I personally have probably never seen that convincing, but um, that's the going theory. So they tend to start on the third island. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> um, so next up um, is a one-year-old female spade Shih Tzu. <laughs> uh, this is the left eye uh, with the findings uh, clinically of microcornea, dermoid, pigmentary keratitis, and glaucoma. Uh, with an IOP of 45, and the duration of uh, is noted uh, since birth. Uh, the other eye in, uh, in this dog is normal, um, so it just seems to be on the left eye that is affected. So grossly, I'm sorry, what breed did you say? Shih Tzu. Um, so, <laughs> yes, I Everyone in the room is pointing out that you can see the reflection of the camera um, in the fluid. So just kind of ignore that. A, no thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, cordia up here uh, is kind of very thickened and roughened, and you might be able to tell it's, it's a little bit pigmented. Um, our lens is here, uh, seems to be surrounded by some uh, white tissue. Uh, but it's also very uh, like dark red, brown, um, kind of uh, reminiscent of hemorrhage and such. Um, we can't really see the retina on the back of the globe and that is because, or lining the cord, um, because it is plastered up against uh, the back of the lens. And in this view, uh, there did not seem to be any uh, connection between the retina um, and what should be the optic nerve head. and even given the optic nerve head, it wasn't really obvious that it was there um, and there really wasn't an evidence of an optic nerve uh, grossly. 
uh, we did note that there is this sort of like dark uh, pigmented um, region in the posterior sclera um, that we'll take a look at um, microscopically here. Um, the uh, extraocular tissue was removed, but we did note that um, in the um, lateral uh, conjunctiva, uh, that basically we couldn't tell that there was conjunctiva there and that the haired skin was sort of directly adjacent to the cornea, um, so consistent with the dermoid. Um, and that sort of temporal limbus seems to be um, really commonplace in dogs for the dermoids to develop. And in the other half of the globe, there was also no connection of any retinal tissue to the back of the eye anywhere. So. Um, yep. So cornea up at the top, uh, we can see our lens here. Um, uh, again, lots of sort of tissues surrounding it. And here is that little, um, what was that pigmented nodule at the back um, of the globe. So we can see that there's a little like divot um, in the uh, posterior sclera. And here's our extra section, which uh, we'll also take a look at a little bit closely. Okay. So there's that little divot we'll come back to, make my way back to the front of the eye. All right. So here is our surface um, of the cornea. It's very hyperplastic and has a nice layer of keratin forming on top of it. And then we can also tell that there's also some pigment accumulation within the epithelial cells. So a nice pigmentary keratopathy. Um, there's some pigment cells in the stroma below. So some pigmentary incontinence uh, with some blood vessels, so vascularization um, of the cornea stroma. I'm enormous vessel, Sharon. Yeah. <laughs> Put a dog there. Right. Um, and then as we head back towards um, the irritocore angle, uh, we've got this really robust um, pre irritable fibrovascular membrane that comes up, uh, blends with the membrane that kind of crosses the pupil. So pupillary membrane, it goes across the back. So post irritable fibrovascular membrane. And then you can see the distortion um, that this poor iris leaflet is very squished and compressed uh, by the vasculature or the fibrovascular membranes. Um, as you go along, we can appreciate cataractus change um, in the lens with these liquefied lens fibers. As we keep going, some of the lens epithelium also contains um, some hemosiderin pigment granules which was pretty interesting. Um, there's also some scattered cells within the lens that have similar pigment as well. Um, and then there's a little bit of mineral foci here um, for this cataract. And then here's a look at the other sadly distorted iris leaflet from these fibrovascular membranes. There's quite a bit of uh, hyperplastic irritociliary epithelium in there, too. Yes. Would be. Yeah, all those guys. All loop. So it's just part of. I think it's just reactive change. Yeah. Just. Yeah, but they can be very confusing. If you've never seen it, you know. Cool. Okay. And. So, yes. No other retina at the back of the eye. As we follow this tissue here, um, it used to be retina. Um, it's really hard to pick out um, any layers. Um, the other thing of note as I scroll along here and look at this tissue that's severely atrophied um, is that there's no blood vessels in it. So it's an avascular retina, um, which occurs we have some congenital issues with development here. Um, there is hemorrhage 
in the vitreous. And I'm going to go look at the other section here to point that out a little bit better. Um, there's a little bit of blood vessels in the vitreous itself, uh, but the retina itself uh, is pretty avascular. Also impressive is how dark the lens was grossly right and then right like mm -hmm. here makes you wonder if all that he was considering that we saw was enough to cause that mm -hmm. you know yeah and microscopic change which is pretty yeah fast. yeah and i think so um because here moving to our uh extra section of the globe here is a pretty dense um collagenous membrane um with some blood yeah. vessels in the back the eye um again some nice hemosiderin and hematoidin um, pigment in here. And as we follow this posterior lens capsule here, there's some posterior migration of the lens epithelium, so that should not be uh, on the backside of the lens. It gets really thin and sort of disappears here. And then these cells inside the lens are also outside the lens and sort of surrounding this little bit of hemorrhage um, with macrophages or other epithelial, lens epithelial cells um, in this little membrane. And so I, I think that, yeah, the hemorrhage and the pigment is probably what caused the little um, discoloration to the lens grossly. Um, and then going back here to look at this little um, divot, uh, we see that the sclera and the choroid um, just kind of fall into this little outpouching. Um, and we've got some um, RPE cells, retinal pigmented epithelial cells um, lining. Um, so uh, a little coloboma uh, coming out the back here. Uh, there was no evidence of an optic nerve head or optic nerve um, in the sections uh, that we looked at. Um, So probably a um, presumed optic nerve aplasia as well um, in this case. Because the big vessels there suggest that that's where we are, kind of around, but you're mm -hmm. right, yeah, there's no, yeah. Yeah. and that's even better suggesting that there it's you know, aplasia because you have all the vessels in that area, but no optic nerve. And... Yeah. Cool. Um, and then, Let's quickly think, hopefully Dr. D's on the call okay. and monitoring from home because uh, he was uh, interested in an iron stain um, just to prove that there was iron, that the, the pigment that we were seeing in the lens epithelium, oh my goodness, was indeed iron. And in fact, it is. So this nice bright blue, in the lens epithelium here, you can also see it out here in our hemocytic related macrophages. Um, and so um, just a nice example of some pigment in hemocytic uptake of the lens epithelial cells. Um, again, probably attributing to that discoloration to the lens grossly. Um, and then briefly, um, we did look at sections of that um, uh, lateral conjunctiva uh, where the coloboma uh, was reported. Um, and so uh, we have a section of haired skin and here's maybe a little bit of what used to be conjunctiva, uh, but the importance being that um, there's no evidence of like my bomain glands or anything to indi you know, indicate like eyelid margin. And so these are well-formed um, Haired skin, basically, so pretty consistent with a, a turbine. All right. Um, so uh, a lot of congenital things um, going on. Um, um, we've got the the pigmentary keratopathy um, on the on the lens, or sorry, on the cornea. Um, all the fibrovascular membrane formations and, and lots of synechia uh, and iris distortion. 
Um, those peri-lenticular uh, fibrovascular membranes sort of at the back of the eye uh, probably uh, represent a persistent fetal vasculature, uh, especially given that there's um, no blood vessels in the retina, um, there's um, retinal detachment, severe atrophy. Um, there is uh, the cataract formation, um, again, which could be congenital or possibly juvenile. Um, and then that little posterior lens capsule defect uh, with the lens epithelium kind of coming out. Um, and uh, sclerochoral or slash coronal uh, coloboma, uh, where the optic nerve and head should be. And so uh, again, presumed optic nerve uh, aplasia in that uh, little conjunctival dermoid. Um, so lots of um, congenital changes um, in this little one-year-old dog. But um, again, clinically, they said the other eye was normal. So hopefully no problems associated with congenital lesions, but uh, we'll see. And that is all I have. And it looks like we are at time. So thanks everybody for joining us and we look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. And stop recording, right?